Welcome to the Caregiving in a Pandemic Accessing Services and Support webinar. We'd like to ask Larry Curley to provide our welcome. Larry, you're on mute. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this uh, particular webinar and hopefully that as we go along that you will learn something about what we're trying to do and how one can help uh, each other uh, during this time of pandemic. And before we go any further, um, as in any traditional organization, uh, one starts off with a prayer. So I'll do a prayer and start it off and um, do it in my own native uh, Navajo language. Thank you very much. In the prayer. Thank you, Larry. My name is Jennifer Gilson with Kaufman Associates, and I will be the facilitator today. I'd like to start by explaining the webinar interface. There are two icons located towards the bottom part of your screen. One is the chat bubble, which can be used to interface with folks on the platform. The second is the Q&A bubble for questions and or comments. Although we will be responding to questions at the end of the presentations, you may enter questions or comments at any time into the Q&A box. All phone lines have been muted. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our texts will respond to you. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. We'd like to thank our partners, Kaufman and Associates, National Alliance for Caregiving, Diverse Elders Coalition, and a special thanks to our funder, the John A. Hartford Foundation. We'd like to start today with a poll question. Our first one is, what have been your biggest challenges as a caregiver related to COVID-19? And this is multiple choice, select as many as um, are necessary. Increased isolation, anxiety, access to services, financial strain, job loss, others, if you're comfortable, you could list it in the chat box or none. Just gonna give you another moment so that you can respond. Thank you so much. So our top ones are increased isolation, anxiety, and access to services. Thank you so much for that participation. We'd like to also have another poll question. Did you experience any positive outcomes from the pandemic? Again, it's, you, it's multiple choice and you can choose as many as appropriate. We've got decreased commute time, lowered expenses, learned or used new technology, spent more time with family, other, if you're comfortable, you can list it in the chat box, or none of the above. I'll just give you another moment or two to go ahead and respond to the poll question. Thank you so much for that. It looks like we've got spent more time with family and decreased commute time as um, two of the top outcomes. I would like now to turn it over to Becky. Good morning, everybody. We're so 
happy and honored to have all of you coming to, to our webinar. And we're very excited to share the discussion that we're going to have today. I wanted to let you know that um, we the first 75 attendees will be receiving a gift card. And if you've chosen that you want to receive materials over email, um, then that's how we'll, we'll send it to you via email. If you have some other preference, we need to make sure we have a good address for you so we can mail it to you. Okay. And like I um, I'm Becky Morgan. I'm a project coordinator with NICOA. And I would like to introduce our panel. The first speaker is Captain Susan Carroll, MD Chief Medical Officer for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Division of Tribal Affairs. Dr. Carroll is um, involved with the Children's Health Insurance Program at the CMS tribal affairs, and it serves as the point of contact on Indian health issues for the agency. She is also an enrolled member of the Tuscarora Indian Nation. Melissa Klupach was born and raised in Willow, Alaska and attended the University of Idaho where she received a Bachelor of Sciences degree in Animal Sciences Production and Nutrition Dietetics and a Master of Science degree in Sports Science and Nutrition. She's now an assistant professor in dietetics and nutrition at the University of Alaska Anchorage, teaching courses such as survey of Alaska native nutrition and food and nutrition in a modern Alaska. She was recently awarded funding from the National Resource Center for Alaska Native Elders to implement a traditional foods program at Beans Cafe in Anchorage under federal grant number G0010269. Her goal is to bring people together to share best practices so we can learn from each other, promoting health and wellness throughout our communities. And our final speaker is Larry Curley, who is the Executive Director of the National Indian Council on Aging and a member of the Navajo Nation with over 40 years of experience working in the aging and healthcare fields. He has worked with Congress, other branches of the federal government, and national organizations on aging to develop support for programs affecting elder American Indians. As a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., he successfully advocated for the passage of Title VI of the Older Americans Act, an amendment which he wrote. He is, um, before coming to NICOA, he was Director of Program Development for the Rehoboth McKinley Christian Healthcare Services in Northwest New Mexico. So welcome to all our panelists. We're, we're so thrilled that you're here. Thank you. And to get started with some questions, and I was thinking what we could do if it's okay, is I'll ask the question and then Dr. Carroll, if you could answer and then Ms. Klupach and then Larry Curley. All right, our first question sure. is, um, how do you define telehealth? I'll be happy to answer that, Becky, and thank you. It's an easy one for me. Um, the um, definition of telehealth for me came um, from an interaction I had with the Health Resource Service Administration or HRSA um, they have a robust telehealth center and they define telehealth as the use of electronic information and telecommunications technologies to support long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. Thank you. Melissa. Well, I think Dr. Carroll nailed it on the head right there, but I'd also like to add um, that telehealth really helps also with reminders, education, intervention, um, continued monitoring as well, um, and also uh, allows folks to do remote admissions to clinics and to various uh, centers. So um, I Telehealth has been in Alaska for, it feels like eons now. <laughs> Cause I remember when I worked at the Alaska Psychiatric Institute, we were um, several years ago, we were uh, doing telehealth there as well. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, for, for me, it's a very much um, state the same as uh, Dr. Carroll's and uh, Melissa's um, definition of uh, telehealth, but I think there's uh, also another aspect. Sometimes people talk about telehealth and telemedicine, and telemedicine is a little bit more of a clinical, more of a uh, medical type intervention. 
but uh, overall telehealth has been used generically across both of those areas uh, kind of interchangeably. So um, it's an opportunity uh, for people to uh, be able to get in touch with their providers, get education, uh, health information, stuff like that through a variety of tele, uh, telecommunication systems. So, um, so it's not much different than what uh, my two um, previous commenters uh, added. Thank you, Larry. All right, what tips would you offer to our elders on how to prepare before they go in or prepare for an effective telehealth visit? I'll be happy to start the list of things that um, I think people should pay attention to. Um, as a doctor, I, I sometimes see it from the clinical side, the, the doctor's perspective, but I also try to keep in mind what it's like being the patient and having been a caregiver um, on the patient side with my mom, um, I, I had to pay, pay attention to the telehealth visits that we had immediately after her return from the hospital. So um, I, I frequently remember also as a clinician with the Indian Health Service that the IHS clinic has waiting rooms where patients will wait sometimes for hours um, and it's really sometimes a social event, sitting there in the waiting rooms, um, catching up with friends, neighbors, other patients. Um, telehealth and telemedicine now cut that waiting room event away. And so there's a lot less social encounters. Um, there's maybe some less continuity of care as, as um, different providers cover clinics. Um, and that can be somewhat isolating. So it's important when you're going to have your telehealth visit to um, be familiar with the technology you're using, how to click on the mute and the stop video buttons and um, how to make sure you have your computer plugged in so you don't lose connections. Um, make sure you have your caregiver or your family member with you to help run the technology and help focus you because it's, it's a little daunting to be staring at a screen and trying to make sure everything's running and be cognizant of all the issues that you want to ask about. Um, so get your list of questions in order. Um, if you're going to see somebody for a wound that you might have or um, something you want them specifically to look at, make sure you have it unwrapped and ready to go. Um, have your medication list ready because no, invariably they'll say, what have you been taking? And very often you freeze up because you can't recall what you took that morning or did I take that twice yesterday or did I take it at all? And so make sure you have your lists of medicines ready to go. And sometimes it helps to have headphones in because there's many distractions um, when you're on a uh, looking at a screen and sometimes having headphones plugged into that device is helpful. Sometimes you need an interpreter because doctors tend to speak very medically and it's sometimes difficult to understand. Um, and make sure you let them know what your issues are. Many times it's social issues. It's not really that you have an earache or a pain, it's more, um, trying to figure out how you're gonna to get to your next visit, what your diet's gonna be, um, your use of traditional medicines and traditional healers, how that impacts what's going on with you. That's very important too. And sometimes it's just financial concerns. How am I gonna pay for this visit? Is this visit covered? Um, should I be enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid, which are big issues that I deal with right now? And I think I'll stop there and let everybody else chime in, but those are things I thought of in answering that question. That was awesome. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Carroll really hit it with the having a caregiver there, whether it's a family member or, or a, uh, a caretaker. I think that's really important to have um, someone else there with you uh, as an elder, maybe, um, that like, like Dr. Carroll said, there's a lot of information coming at you and not all providers speak in 
layman's terms, right? They speak all the this medical jargon and it's like a it's a foreign language basically. So it's nice to have someone else there to um, write notes and maybe something was missed that the uh, family member or caregiver can um, can get as well. Also, I know we're living in this virtual Zoom, Microsoft Teams world right now, but not everyone has the access to those um, virtual um, capabilities. Maybe they don't have internet access. Maybe the bandwidth just really isn't there. I know we've had that issue in, in uh, Alaska. But uh, to, it's important for us as providers to offer phone visits as well. Granted, we, we don't get to see the, the facial expressions and, and some of that body language, but uh, it's just as important. Um, and so uh, the phone visits or, or the virtual face-to-face -face meetings really um, also is a wellness check too. So, um, and as we, uh, as a, a, another tip for elders is that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay. Don't be shy. Feel free to voice mm -hmm. your concerns. And uh, if you forget to ask those questions, it's okay. Um, because you can ask those questions in another phone call or maybe an email or ask your family member to ask those questions too. Thank you. I, th I think that um, in, in terms of getting ready for uh, a conversation with your provider or with the health uh, care professional, um, I think Dr. Carroll uh, mentioned, you know, get your questions ready ahead of time make sure that you have a list somehow. And I think that Melissa mentioned something that's very critical, I think, and that is having someone there with you that understands what the doctor or the provider is saying. And too many times I know that elders have a thing about doctors or providers that they know everything. No, they don't know everything. So you got to ask those questions. You've got to, um, in a lot of ways, uh, kind of challenge them from time to time. What do you mean by that? Why should I do that? You know, those kinds of questions uh, are things that um, our elders need to ask those questions. I think the other part of, of this whole process, as Melissa was saying, we live in a virtual world these days. And I think that for those elders who have gone through and have successively, or at least learn how to work the system, that they should also be uh, information providers, letting other elders know that, hey, it was this easy. This is how you do it. This is how I got on. And it wasn't all that scary. You know? And I think that that's how elders who have successfully navigated this whole virtual world thing can share that information so that other people uh, can learn from them as well and not be afraid of utilizing the technology that we now have. And so that would be something that I would suggest and recommend to elders out there. One, have your questions ready to have somebody that can interpret for you and be ready to tell other people how easy it was for you to get that system going. Um, one of the things I'd just like to mention as uh, Melissa indicated, that some areas of the country do not have the, the, the broadband width enough um, to, to carry on a video type conversation. There are telephones that are available. And I know that with the National Indian Council on Aging, we just started experimenting with a concept called training by cell that one can get on there and utilize. You don't need the internet. You can utilize that particular uh, technology to get that kind of information as well. So there are all kinds of new technologies out there. And um, even I, uh, have difficulty from time to time, forget how to hit, hit the mute button. So, you know, you know it's, a, it's a learning process, but I would encourage our elders to continue um, experimenting with those systems that are out there. We've all been there, <laughs> forgetting the mute button. Um, this For this round, Larry, can we start with you? Um, and 
this is the before topic. You, Becky, before you go on, can I just add one yes. more? Sure. Um, because having been the caregiver for my mom who had a bad episode of COVID this year, mm. when she needed a, a new cell phone, she was befuddled because it wasn't like the old cell phone. Mm. And I want to tell those of you that have experienced some new technology, whenever you get a new cell phone, it's de debilitating. <laughs> Look to your family, your kids. The kids today just have a way of knowing which way to go and how to get it. So take your phone and ask your, the youth in your family to show you over and over how to do a FaceTime or how to which button to push to call somebody. And sometimes um, if you're hard of hearing, you just don't hear the phone. And so pushing that, um, that volume button to the max and keeping the phone near you is helpful so that you can hear the phone, you can you can communicate with face if, if that is helpful and reassuring um, is also a good thing to, to think about. Thanks. Ben. Good good points. Yeah. Have you seen those beautiful beaded uh, holders so you can keep your phone right with you? <laughs> yeah. So nice. Um, Okay, so the next topic is community response. And so Larry, um, in general, how do you think that Indian countries responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, I have mixed feelings about um, how to rate how we have responded. Um, I was just recently looking at some data that came out of the National Indian Health Board, a study that was done by them. And, you know, the the infection rates uh, among Indian tribes around the country. Um, for example, in New Mexico, 43% of the, the death rates in New Mexico um, are Native Americans. Mm. Yet they only comprise 10% of the total population in the state of New Mexico. In Arizona, 15% of the deaths are Native Americans, and yet they only comprise 5% of the state population. In terms of total deaths in Indian country, there has been over 2,128 deaths according to NIHB as of November 25th. Of that number, of that number, 59% um, of the deaths that have occurred as a result of COVID have happened in the state of Arizona and the state of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So those two states um, comprise a major significant number. So, so that question brings up, so what's going on? How have we responded? And I think that one of the things that I, I think that has happened is that some of the tribes have taken a proactive uh, approach to this uh, by, um, immediately declaring emergencies, um, doing things like uh, requiring stay at home uh, policies that have been implemented, closing down uh, public facilities. And for example, even the gaming facilities have been closed. So that has reduced the number of spread. And finally, some of the tribes across the country have just closed off their reservations and communities to outside people. I know here in New Mexico, for example, the Pueblo Laguna, uh, Santa, San Felipe have closed off their reservations. I know tribes up in Washington have done the same thing. So they've taken some very affirmative actions. And so I think that they're, in some ways, they're develop in, developing and implementing in policies. But I think at the bottom of all of this, from the way I look at it, is that their actions have been basically uh, on the foundation of tribal sovereignty. We can do what we want in our communities, regardless of what the state says. And I think that's a prime example is South Dakota, where the state is not really enforcing too many uh, preventive type CDC recommendations. And yet there are tribes out there who are closing off their reservations, requiring masks, you know, the CDC recommendations. So I think that tribes have responded well in that sense. Um, but the numbers, um, it just basically indicates that there is um, underlying conditions such as the whole thing related to uh, the social determinants of health that have played a major role in the, the death rates in Indian country. 
So that would be my, my response at this point. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carroll? Well, I just have to echo Larry's response. Um, I was reading an article this morning about um, the numbers that they're escalating again and touch base with a friend at Shiprock where you know they have 30 patients in their facility, which is almost maximally filled. <clears throat> their ICU is filled. I think um, they're doing their best in getting um, care for patients. Um, and I think the tribal sovereignty and controlling their borders is very important. Uh, and I think it has had pretty good impact. So um, I'm going to echo what Larry says. I had some experience when I was at IHS with the H1N1 flu a few years back. Um, we did a lot of, um, not pandemic, but epidemic pre preparations, and hopefully that helped a lot as um, tribes had to face this pandemic. Um, and I think there's there's definitely a lot of communication. The White House call that happens every couple of weeks and IHS's um, Admiral Wiaki's updates have been helpful in their, their working with the government. Um, again, it's a very difficult situation. There's a lot of flux that's going on and um, many things that complicate what can be done and what is being done, not to mention the significant politics you have to listen to. So I, I think the tribes are, are right on top of things. I think they're doing a great job. And um, just have to echo what Lowry has said. Thanks. Thank you. And Professor Klupach, give us the perspective from Alaska. I think um, in the beginning, I think we... Um, did a great job. Um, most of our rural communities really protected themselves uh, from Corona and uh, with shins um, and local health measures. Um, however, as fall came into play and fishing season, um, um, more cases coming into our villages. And once that happened, it Oh, did we lose you? Unfortunately, we lost her. She should be coming back in just a second. I'm back. Sorry. See, <laughs> internet. <laughs> this is what happens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as it started uh, getting into our villages, it just really spread like wildfire. Um, it really hurts my heart that this is happening. Um, and it's um, Southwest Alaska and Western Alaska recently has been hit tremendously. We had um, a, a Southwest Alaska native leader recently pass away this week. Um, Small villages like Gamble with only 700 people had 33 cases, at least 33 cases in one month. And um, it's, it's uh, and our um, major medical center in Anchorage, Alaska Native Medical Center, they're trying the best that they can and ANTHC, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, they're all trying the best that they can on all fronts to provide um, the care and um, that folks need. Okay, thank you. Okay, the from your perspective, Larry, Mr. Curley, sorry. <laughs> um, what do you think is the most important thing that the media and news coverage is getting wrong or not talking about related to COVID and American Indian and Alaska Native communities? Well, I, I, one of the things I note is that every time an issue related to COVID-19 comes up on the media, you know, it's, it's all of the negative aspects of Indian life. You know, the, the poverty level, the lousy housing, lack of water. It's always 
a focus on them. And I think that one of the things that I really feel needs to be looked at and mentioned is that there is a tremendous amount of resilience out there, a tremendous amount of hope out there. And I think that that's something that needs to be discussed more, mentioned by the media even more so. And I think from an elderly and a, a, an aging perspective, you know, the, the data that I've looked at uh, indicates, for example, on Navajo, 60% of the deaths that have occurred on the Navajo Nation has been people over the age of 60. So if you take that 60% and extrapolate it and apply it to the 2,128 deaths that have happened, that's over 1,277 deaths, elderly people who have passed away since the beginning of the COVID. 1,277 people have died who are over the age of 60. And if you take a look at that and you wonder, okay, how is that affecting Indian life, the traditions, the customs, the language, so forth? That 60 years multiplied by that 1,000, we've lost over 76,000 years of customs, history, language, traditions just by the mere fact those older people have passed away. And that is disconcerting to me because one of the things that I see is that I think the media needs to understand is that those elderly people who have passed away represent a walking encyclopedia to Indian history, Indian culture, traditions, customs, and so forth. And so I think that more than anything else, I'd like to see more of a discussion at the, on the media um, about the resilience, how strong we are, how we maintain the hope and how we look to the future and say, we will be fine. We will get through this, that historically we've gone through much more of uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, as Dr. Carroll mentioned, the H1N1, um, I was up in Northern Nevada when we went through that and the preparation that we went through so I think that that's something that I would like to see more of rather than the negative side of, of Indian life. Thank you, good point. Um, Dr. Carroll? Sure, um, and I wanna echo Mr. Curley again. Um, I think the media has not done a very good job at presenting the entire story. We hear a little snippet and it's mostly been about Navajo um, and I know those numbers are, are, are not good. And as a tribe, they have their own tribal epidemiology center that is get, gathering the information. And I'm not sure that we're hearing the full story. The data that we're hearing is somewhat fragmented. There's a lot of, to be said about um, privacy issues for tribes. They many times don't wanna have their numbers displayed across a screen. Um, but there's ways to get the information out for the population or for the state so that individual tribes might not need to be specifically fingered. But it, it's good for all to know where the native tribal populations are going with this COVID. And from my own knowledge from CMS and listening to um, IHS and the White House calls, the numbers are, are, are large. Um, they, they point to great loss three and a half times the average white population. Um, and that, that's real, that, those, those numbers are real and you don't hear about that on any of the news stations. So I don't think media is doing a very good job covering our, our population. Uh, the real time data fluctuates and changes month to month and um, I think um, as time goes on, we will hopefully have the full picture, um, but it's gonna take some time to get there and understand the numbers, the ultimate mortality rates to help us put together what, what really went on with this pandemic. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Klupach? 
I completely agree with Larry and Dr. Carroll. The, the media isn't making enough of a deal about this. They're not saying, hey, this is a problem. Our Pacific Islanders and Alaska natives are more susceptible to getting COVID. Hey, this is a big deal. Like Larry said, thousands, hundreds, thousands of years of traditional knowledge is being lost. This is a big deal. Um, so I think we need to say that this is this is this is a problem. And um, like we've talked about earlier, H1N1 in 2009, that was a major problem. And yet things things didn't change. We're still seeing the same things happening with this pandemic. We need to make changes. We need to make this a big deal. And the media has an option to make uh, their stories an educational piece as well. Um, and also they could start talking about equity and healthcare. So that's my two cents. I like, um, Becky, I just like to add on to what um, Dr. Carroll mentioned, which is the data. You know, and the data is just uh, is is uh, questionable. The the you know when we start talking about uh, what racial group um, has, you know, they some we don't even get sometimes uh, somebody by the name of Guerrero, let's say in Navajo, or Martinez down in uh, Tohono O'odham down in southern Arizona. That name Martinez or Guerrero is Hispanic. And they're labeled as Hispanic, and and so that there's the misclassification of individuals and people, and so that there's the questionable um, data regarding racial background, so we don't get the accurate information uh, that we can use to to develop uh, intervention techniques and, and policies. But I think the other thing is that you know more recently when the elections were happening, I think CNN. <laughs> Classified as a classified Indian people as something else. <laughs> so that's a problem there. <laughs> yes. Um, because this is such a great, rich discussion, we need to kind of prioritize some of our questions in order to fit them all in. And so if you'll bear with me, what we're going to do is maybe combine a few of these, if that's okay. And uh, Professor Klupach, I'd like to start with you. And if you could please help us define long distance care pre-COVID and now, you know, what are the differences between what it used to mean and what it is now? Oh, and I'm sorry. And also what kinds of resources? This is me trying to combine it and not doing a good job, but you know. So what is it and, and what are the resources? Um, well, I think we, um, I think for, for me or for us, long distance care is really related to telehealth. Um, and we, we've been doing that in Alaska for a number of years, but it really <laughs> definitely exploded uh, since the pandemic started. And yes, there were some rough points here and there because, um, you know, many people didn't know how to use those virtual um, programs, whether Zoom, Microsoft Teams, whatever. Um, so, I think um, a, a part of the reason why we've used telehealth for so long is that it's very difficult for us to get providers to our rural locations. Um, we tend to get a lot of locum uh, providers from down south and they have no what does that clue. Mean? Locum, so mm -hmm. out of state uh, travel type uh, providers um, they're the, only there for a short period of time. Their contract is very short um, and they are actually quite expensive. Um, so mm. they don't know a lot about our cultures. Uh, and of course, each region is very different and 
don't know about our traditional foods. Um, so I think at UAA, we're trying to grow our own uh, providers so that uh, we can provide better care. Uh, that's not to say our locums aren't providing great care, but I think we can provide better care with our, our local folks. Uh, in terms of, I think the other question was resources. Right, I think um, right. How do, what questions do you recommend? Sorry, as I jam those all together. <laughs> it's all good. Well, um, I have to say, I really enjoy the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Long Term Services. Getting all that out in one. So, <laughs> the the newsletter. Oh my gosh, it has so much information and the latest newsletter was really dedicated to celebrating caregivers for uh, in November for National Family Caregiver Month and a lot of great resources within that newsletter. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Maybe we can try and find a link for that and post that. Um, Dr. Carroll, what do you think um, it's yeah, been well, a while. long distance care. And <laughs> I can I can give you from um, from the CMS perspective that long term services and support newsletter is found on our website, which is um, gocms.gov backslash AIN. And if you scroll through that web link, um, you'll find lots of great information. Not only the long term services and supports but we recently added a very nice behavioral health um, uh, website that will be very helpful to everyone for finding sites for behavioral health care. Um, and there are other many uh, important enrollment, outreach and enrollment uh, links. Um, I'll very briefly mention the flu is a, a big issue we're now gonna start to worry about on top of COVID. And we've got some good flyers and uh, bookmarks and, um, different it, it, instruments to help keep everybody on top of the present um, medical issues. So just a little plug for the DTA um, website. Um, and just to kind of circle back to the uh, long distance care issues, um, half of our population isn't in long distance situations. So I want to make a plug for the urban population that might reside in uh, a well-populated uh, community with um, multiple uh, hospitals and clinics, but it doesn't serve sometimes to be that easy to access. Um, I know as we brought my mom into the Brigham, a very big facility, um, she was one person that had to walk up to the emergency room on her own um, to be seen and be admitted. And that can be very daunting for anyone who's a little bit older it took all of my brothers and sisters and myself to, to work with her to get that done. And so um, access to services can sometimes be just as challenging in an inner city as it is in a remote island off of Alaska. I, I totally appreciate both situations are very difficult. Um, I think it's important that you establish a good connection if you have an IHS or tribal provider near you so that you do get good services. They have good um, connections for meals on wheels, telehealth follow-up, social services that you might need for additional support, behavioral health needs, which have also skyrocketed as part of this pandemic. And make sure as a caregiver that you're the squeaky wheel. Um, I can't say that enough because if you have someone that has been sick, has been in a hospital setting, they don't have the energy to speak up for themselves and they need that caregiver to, you know, say that they need more physical therapy visits or that they need additional VNA visits for whatever issues that they have. So that caregiver has to um, work hard to get the resources that you need. And um, sometimes it takes um, a stern voice or, you know, I would have, I would never do that to my patient, as I have said in my advocating for my mother um, through a, a very difficult medical system. So um, those are my best thoughts. I'll let you keep going. 
I think you're, you're right that people get better care if someone knows there's a caregiver paying attention. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that point. And um, Mr. Curley. Yeah, I the whole idea of long distance care um, pre COVID, post COVID, or, or at least we're in, the, in right in the middle of it right now. I I think distance becomes relative in, in a lot of ways. Um, before all of this hit, you know, um, long distance uh, care was basically, for example, a CHR community health representative. Uh, going 10 miles down the road and providing that care. Um, people driving that far and not thinking about it. And it's, it's, it's part, of, part of the package that comes with living on a res. And even as Dr. Carroll said, even in an urban area, uh, having lived in, in Boston, you know, to, to navigate the streets and to try to get to another place, um, I remember when I was there, I would drive from Boston and go up to Maine. It would take me almost three hours to get there. It's only a distance of about a hundred some miles uh, to get there. And here and in, in rural areas, a hundred miles really is uh, about an hour and a half drive. And it's not really that much of a, a problem. But, you know, so pre-COVID pre distance, uh, was 10 miles, long distance or whatever. But now in, in, the, in the midst of this pandemic, the house next door is now long distance mm. it, because people are isolated and they're quarantined or they have stay at home requirements. And so that the caregiver now looks at that and sees that as, as long distance. And so I think that in this era of, of COVID, uh, what are the resources that are out there? There are, um, and I hate saying this because I keep saying, people say, oh, go to our website. You know, some places don't have uh, internet that they can access a website. And telephone service sometimes is spotty. You have to go to the highest mountain in the area to be able to call somebody, you know? So I think that the, the resources that are out there are, are, are out there where you have your family members because most of the homes are, are multi-generational to be able to uh, rely on your younger people to find those resources for you. And because they are the ones as Dr. Carol mentioned earlier they know how to navigate that crazy technological world that we live in and have them help you find those resources. I know that, um, uh, for example, the National Indian Health Board has a website. CMS has a website. The National Indian Council on Aging has a website that uh, provides uh, access to resources that are available out there. Um, even your tribal council members out there our resources that can help you navigate that system as well. And so I think that that's a, a way that we can talk about long distance, pre, post, and how do you get to the resources that are available? Very good, thank you. Um, I wanted to mention in the chat, um, per our previous discussion, uh, one of our attendees said, many Pueblos have Hispanic surnames, Lujan Ortiz, and are counted in national assessments funding numbers as Hispanics. So that misclassification does happen quite a bit. Um, and then um, Professor Klupach provided the link for the newsletter sign up in the chat. So if everybody can please click on that chat and then there'll be a hyperlink so you can sign up for that newsletter. And that sounds like it'd be a really uh, great resource. So thank you very much. Um, there's also a question in here from um, an attendee, it says, how can FEMA crisis programs responding to COVID-19 in Colorado get their free services into the hands of these populations? Um, does anybody have an answer for that one? I don't. Okay. Um, if we don't have a ready answer in order for us to try to stay on time, um, I will 
we'll look into this and try and respond back. Uh, Larry, did you? Becky, I was, uh, could you repeat that question that was asked? Yeah, it says, how can FEMA crisis programs responding to COVID-19 in Colorado get their free services into the hands of these populations? I know that in recently, there's a, uh, a program that comes out of a, 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 a teleconference that goes on uh, from the administra uh, ACL AOA, the Administration for Community Living and the Administration on Aging. I think it's on Thursdays, they have what they call a blast where you have all the Title VI people that come together who run those programs. They talk about what do I need to do? How do I do this? And I know that one of the questions that was raised uh, some time back was, how do we have access to FEMA? How do we get those crisis funds to our programs? And the answer that AOA, uh, ACL uh, provided to those individuals was get in touch with the FEMA regional director in region eight, which would be Colorado. Um, get in touch with them, see how those funds are coming down because some of it go through the state and go then finally to the tribe. And there's a process that's been developed for tribes to access those funds as well. So it takes a tribal action uh, to uh, access those funds. So that would be, uh, I think, uh, just a very general response to that particular question. Thank you, thank you. Um, another comment um, says, the National Resource Center on ALANNH Aging, ACL funded, just received IHS IRB approval to move forward with their needs assessment of urban Indian elders. AARP is funding the assessment, contact Colette Adamson for additional information. Oh, and then um, the comment is Jasmine Applin. The email is in the in the chat. Has direct programs to FEMA, so that's another way to uh, answer that. Yeah, great. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Carroll, as I try to combine these questions again, um, we're wanting to talk about accessing services for older adults in both rural and urban settings. And so if you could explain or go over a little bit of what have the challenges been, especially this year, for caregivers that try to access services and then what resources, so the challenges and then the resources for urban and uh, uh, rural caregivers. That's a, that's a very good question, Becky. Um, and in looking through all my pre-webinar answers, it's the one I didn't have a lot of response to. Um, I, I suspect that um, the challenges this year are for everyone and that it doesn't matter if you're rural or you're urban, um, but you have to work with your providers, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your physical therapist, whoever they are to help you with your personal experience. So I don't have any one person to point to. Cynthia LeCount on our um, from ACL might have some ideas um, in the chat for us, um, but there are many challenges just to, you know, getting to a provider, um, physically being at a hospital site if you have, if you need that type of care um, and other issues. So I, I won't belabor it. I, I don't have a good answer for your question right at the moment. It's an evolving situation. And I just wanted to let everybody know that Professor Klupach is having internet issues and had to stop her video in order to minimize those issues. We run into that every time we have a meeting here in New Mexico. So we really appreciate you hanging in there, Professor. Um, Larry, what do you think about the challenges and resources for caregivers um, trying to access services? Well, I, I think that as when the whole thing started, I think that there was lack of information, lack of knowledge about what this COVID looks like and what it feels like and what is has the potential of doing. You know, like we're now talking about uh, long haulers and the impact of the COVID on, on individuals and, and the lasting effects of COVID. We didn't know that uh, back then. We now know a lot more about uh, the, uh, the virus. And so I think that as we moved along from the very beginning, there was that increase the, the incidence and the pandemic 
um, almost reached a crisis point, for example, like in New York um, and different parts of the country, it just totally spiked. And now um, as we go through uh, at the uh, another level, when it's spiking again. And during that period of the high spikes in the pandemic, what I'm finding is that a lot of the hospitals, for example, are saying we're delaying certain kinds of uh, uh, procedures. Um, we'll have to hold off on a certain uh, procedure that we think is not that critical. And so that also limits the, the access because the hospitals are being overburdened and as Dr. Carroll said in Shiprock, for example, they're overloaded right now. They're, they're maxing out in terms of the kinds of care that they can um, access. So with somebody who has type two diabetes, you know, is gonna have problems accessing a hospital and getting the kind of care. So there's, that's the reality of what's happening out there right now. And hopefully when the curve starts flattening out, we will be able to access services a little bit easier. And I think that what's happening across the country, and if you take a look at the map of where um, the COVID issues are rising, it's almost every state in the, in the country that's experiencing it. And so the reality is that it is, it is a growing, uh, it's a challenge out there now. Um, but I think as one of the things I do know is you know, if you're persistent, you know, sometimes you even have to bang on the table to get access to services. And if that's what's necessary, do what's necessary. Um, don't just say, okay, and just go back into your corner of the room and accept the answer that's being given to you. I think that people have to be a little bit more persistent. I know that in Indian country, we're not that adamant about things. And uh, we're usually pretty, uh, Go, we go along with whatever is being told, but if we really need the services and it's that critical of an issue, I think we need to be a little bit more forceful in accessing those services. So it's just essentially um, being an advocate for you or having someone be an advocate for you and getting those services. Thank you. Um, Professor Klupach, are you with us? I am, um, <laughs> for how long, I don't know. <laughs> well, what we're was, happy as long as you're here. <laughs> what was the question again? I'm sorry. Yes, um, we're looking at the accessing services, both in urban and rural settings, challenges and resources for those two. Um, so I think, uh, for the state of Alaska, we've had, um, before COVID even started, um, we've had some major budget cuts and they continue throughout um, this year. And I think that's really affected access to services throughout the state. Um, for instance, our ferry system, which is always, um, <laughs> it feels like on the chopping block um, is has limited services and this has really affected uh, food security throughout the coastal areas. Um, some other challenges I think for access to services would include what I've experienced today, internet <laughs> stability, <laughs> bandwidth. Um, but there are a lot of great resources out there. Uh, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, although housed in Anchorage, um, helps the hubs um, throughout the state of Alaska and really tries the best that they can to provide um, uh, the best care and um, as fast as they can uh, for all of Alaska. Uh, and also for South Central specifically, I think South Central Foundation has done a great job as well. They are a great resource too. Uh, in fact, um, to help me prepare for this 
panel, I contacted a couple of my um, actually former interns, dietetic interns who are uh, now dietitians uh, for South Central Foundation and Alaska Native, and they helped me um, talk about some of the pros and cons of telehealth and and um, they've really, uh, they too are great resources. I think Alaska is kind of helping the rest of us see what may become part of our futures as well. You guys have done a good job of trying to overcome the huge distances you face. Um, just to go over what's in the chat, it says Cynthia LeCount has direct access to April Lipinski at FEMA. And there's a plug for a presentation I'm doing next week. Um, it says from Tina Stacy, it says, feel free to contact me. I'm the FEMA senior care, senior care specialist for FEMA, FEMA crisis counseling program. And I believe this is all in Colorado, I hope. And then it provides an email. Um, maybe Jennifer, if it's possible, could we send this link out to all the attendees as well so that they can, I believe she meant to share that with everybody. Yes. And we've got some questions in the uh, Q&A, but those are for the next part of the program about vaccines. So um, we have got two more questions, y'all. <laughs> so if we can try and um, we're over time already. So, oh, well, but this is it's more important to do this in a good way. So the next area is social isolation. And so, Larry, if you could help us understand what that means and why does it matter? What does it do to impact our health? And then um, what have you seen people doing to try to overcome social isolation? Well, from what I understand, social isolation are people who are basically divorced from the rest of the community, divorced from their, their families um, and, and, and the community that they are in and have no meaningful contacts with the outside world. And the end result of all of this of being, I mean, even I sitting in my own house, you know, from after a while, you get tired of looking at the same walls and looking at the same ceiling. Um, you know, it gets boring. And it, it is uh, 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 one of the, the, the results of the, the pandemic is that um, I recently learned that, not recently, but know that in this country, we have a high level of depression as a result of the, the, the pandemic. Um, when all of this is occurring, people have anxieties, they get, they get depressed, they get, they're lonely, they're wanting to, uh, be able to go out, but they can't do that as a result of the pandemic. Um, they have, they become overly cautious and not, I blame them, I don't blame them, but I think that people, they start looking at other people with a suspicious eye and then look out of the corner of their eye and are you the one that has the COVID? You know, that type of a thing. So there's this suspicion of people. And, and I think that that's the, 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 the result of the, the, the term social isolation. And I think that one of the things that I do see here is that uh, in terms of what are we doing? How can we begin to deal with that? You know, I know that almost every home in, in Indian country has a TV set. And for me, when I get to that point, they have a channel on kids TV. And there's a lot of Bugs Bunny and, you know, uh, cartoons that make me laugh and uh and i think that that's for me that's one of the ways that i deal with it. and i think that that's you know something that's reassuring that something still there's still some continuity out there um stop watching the news so much because that's really it gets depressing after a while and so one of the things that i also see is that on the the internet sometimes or, or on uh um, the social media platforms, uh, Facebook, for example, um, they show Indian uh, ceremonies that are going on. I know that uh, with uh, Colette Adamson out of the University of North Dakota, they did a study where they found that older people like um, seeing, uh, being a part of these traditional ceremonies and, uh, that are going on. And they, and they show that on YouTube, for example, from time to time. 
And I think that's something that uh, utilizing the, the technology to access it, the outside community, that there are still traditions being uh, carried on out there. And that's reassuring to, to people out there. And I think that's something that um, that would be very helpful, but just one of the ways of beginning to deal with that. And you have behavioral health programs out, out there at the tribal level. You know, if you're feeling depressed, you're starting to feel kind of weird, um, talk to those people. That's why they're there. Uh, you have traditional, traditional medicine people out there that you can talk with. Um, let them know how you're feeling. And, you know, they can provide you with some uh, traditional comments and traditional guidance, uh, uh, something that they have uh, have access to and know about. So uh, that would be something how one can begin to address this particular problem uh, out there in Indian country. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Carroll? Sure, so I'm, I'm thinking of it from a couple different perspectives and as a caregiver uh, for my mom recently, I, I just frequently recall being highly anxious and worried um, for, for her. And I think I spent an, a lot of time bothering the healthcare providers. If you have, uh, if your your person is in a, in the hospital, I really advocate to bother the, the providers. Um, they appreciate that you can't run into the hospital. They don't let you in. Um, so you you have to spend a lot of time on the phone talking to them to hear how your loved one is doing and. Um, I, I just have to say so much to the nurses that took care of my mom, what a blessing it was to be able to have them um, talk to me about what was going on. Um, they would help me get the FaceTime going so I could see my mother um, and she was okay. Um, and let her in response talk to, to me and my family because that was, um, so critical. She she didn't know the people that was taking care of her. She was scared as we were back. And being able to communicate um, did alleviate a lot of the anxiety and the questions. And um, so use of that cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. And um, I recall putting on some soothing flute music on my mom's cell phone so she could have that by her side, if she got um, anxious to play, music is a great uh, soother for anxieties and worries. So um, I would advocate using your favorite flute music, spa music, something soothing, learning how to work with diaphragmatic breathing to listen to yourself, um, you know, get yourself to pay attention to the moment mindfulness, although I never got to that in my many things I wanted to do after she got out of the hospital, but um, things to help you um, just cope with your day-to-day -day, um, issues. Social isolation can be very overwhelming, so pick up your phone, play a game, call somebody, um, call your friends, uh, FaceTime if you can. Um, it's good to see each other. I, I have to say, seeing Larry the other day out there um, and we might not have been in contact for many months and um, so it, it feels great I know Cynthia um, Count and I have been working on different projects and it was great to be able to see Cynthia and know what's going on in her world so that phone is is really um, a great means for communication and to help your social isolation it's also important to get outside and, and, and do athletic activities because that will help. Um, the weather might be getting a little bit colder. You might have to do them indoors, but you can definitely go outside and you don't have to walk miles. You can just take a, a quick, you know, five, 10 minute walk outside and that will help refresh you and, and get you back. So social isolation is real. There's help for it all over the place, but simple things eating well, getting exercise, getting your sleep, and communicating with your phone to others can really go a long way. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Um, there's a note in the chat that says, uh, talking about social isolation, too true. Grandmother is blind and hard of hearing. 
Physical isolation welcomes conversation when care provider comes. Also elders experience cultural isolation, especially native language speakers only. So that's a very good point. Um, Professor Klupach, in, in the interest of trying to uh, wrap up this section, if it's okay, can we go ahead and talk about the um, challenges of living in Alaska? And uh, maybe if we just let um, Professor Klupach do this part, y'all, um, talk about the creative solutions for providing foods, traditional foods to elders and tips about eating habits and accessing healthy foods. I realize that's a lot, but. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to keep it within a short. I know I, I could, that's a, that's a whole lecture in itself. I um, know that, I know. <laughs> challenges, well, we are a, <laughs> we are a very remote state as all of you know. And um, so cost of living is very expensive. For instance, uh, uh, a, one head of cabbage could be about $12 in our remote villages or half of a watermelon could be 30 to $60. Um, a gallon of water could be 10 bucks and there are many areas in the state that don't have running water. So of course that cost is an issue and then gas can range from five to 10 bucks a gallon. So um, mm. cost of living is, is quite expensive. But we power through, we do the best that we can, and we have quite a few areas um, that are, are setting gold standards in our state. And I will discuss two of those. The Alaska Native Medical Center um, has a traditional foods donation program. And uh, between 2014 and 2020, they have received a little over 10 tons of traditional food donations for the patients at the hospital. So, um, and in terms of COVID, they've downsized their menu a bit, but they've added some fun things as well. I'm gonna stop my video here for stability, but um, they have, uh, they've had traditional Tuesday for quite some time offering seal stew, but they've also added fishy Friday uh, where they serve smoked hooligan, smoked or fried hooligan or even smoked salmon. And yes, we have our sweet tooth, right? And our elders definitely have their sweet tooth. Uh, so there is uh, <laughs> sweet treat Saturdays offering a little bit more, maybe local fare with um, birch uh, sourdough bread and uh, fireweed jelly, or maybe even rhubarb bread. So a lot of deliciousness there. Wow. Now, in terms of Kotzebue going to the other end of the state, uh, Manilik Association, um, renovated a um, building and we have our first traditional foods processing facility called the Sigluk. And they have a hunter support program, which Cyrus Harris, oh my gosh, this man is a gem. I love him to pieces, uh, such a big heart. He hmm. runs both programs and receives donations at the Sigluk where they are able to provide foods that the long-term care facility, uh, Utu Kana'inat uh, elders um, can have their foods, the foods that they grew up on. And yes, the state of Alaska and CMS have uh, done their audits, their inspections, and they are very supportive of these programs. In addition to that seal oil, is unfortunately a prohibited food item because of its um, risk of botulism, but that is one of the most requested food items and one of the healthiest food items full of omega-3 fatty acids. And so Manilik has been studying how they can safely offer seal oil to their long-term care residents. They've um, worked with folks on Kodiak Island, Brian Hemmelbloom and Chris Sanito, and even found a researcher in Wisconsin that specializes in botulism. So they've been studying this for several years 
and figured out that uh, heat treatment might be the way to safely offer seal oil. And the state of Alaska is very much um, su supportive of this and um, just wants a safe plan, HACCP plan, hazard analysis, critical control point plan to offer it safely to the elders. And they would take a look at um, providing a variance for Manilik to offer this tasty oil, uh, Alaska's condiment, so to speak, <laughs> uh, to our elders. We were talking the other day and I was like, that must be like the green chili for Alaska. You put it on everything. <laughs> yep, dip it in everything <laughs> or dip everything in it. <laughs> So the value of having traditional food when you're in a facility like that has to be very um, beneficial. Oh my gosh. Um, when a long-term care facility, as many of you know, has many restrictions. Uh, so I, I have to hand it to the folks at Manilik Association in looking at ways to offer the foods that the elders grew up on so that they could um, enhance their quality of life. I mean, traditional foods, it's not just about um, how nutrient dense they are because they are the healthiest foods in the world, right? Um, but it's much more than that. These foods are comforting. They are part of the culture. They are part of, they are spiritual they are healing and provide a sense of home when we're not able to be home, whether you're in a hospital or a long-term care facility or even traveling, right? These foods are nourishing in so many ways. Thank you, Professor Kupach. So wonderful. All of you have so much heart for the work and you've been doing this for your careers, all of you are so dedicated and really appreciate having your insights in this panel. Um, I'd like to ask for the attendees, patients, we, we're a little bit over time, if you can please hang in there. I wanted to give this back to Jennifer so she can do the polls and then we'll move on to the next section. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Go ahead and, and launch into this. Uh, the question is, is for those of you who are long distance caregivers, what would make connecting with the person who you are caring for easier? And that's multiple choice and you can choose as many that apply. More updates from nursing homes, assisted living centers on loved ones health, making it easier to connect with aging loved ones virtually, more cheaper ways to provide care amid the pandemic, others if you feel comfortable in the chat box, or nothing, connecting long distance for the person I'm caring for is already easy for me. So we appreciate you responding. And it looks like making it easier to connect with aging loved ones virtually would be more beneficial. Thank you so much. We have one more before we go into our vaccine session. Um, where do you go to access services such as financial help, food support, information on COVID-19, emotional support, or other, um, and you can choose um, as many that apply. We've got church, food bank, friends or family, Title VI programs, other government agency, travel health, uh, elder services or AAA, other government agency, healthcare provider, or other, if you feel comfortable providing that. And we'll just give you just a moment again to Put that in there. Thank you so much. It looks like a, a, most people are getting it from friends and family. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Desiree. Hi, everyone. Um, now we will be transitioning into the testing and validity of the vaccines. And I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Susan Carroll to talk more about this. Thank you, Desiree, and thank you to um, everyone to put up with me for another few minutes. Um, we're switching gears a little bit to talk more about the vaccine. Um, I'm going to come at this with some talking points from the CMS perspective, and then I want to give you a little bit of an update about how 
vaccines are produced for some reassurance reasons. Um, basically, um, under President Trump's leadership, CMS has taken steps to ensure all Americans have access to the COVID-19 vaccine at no cost when it becomes available. We know that our HHS partners at Indian Health Service and the CDC have held tribal consultation and um, urban Indian confer sessions to obtain input on a plan for COVID-19 vaccination implementation and distribution plans in Indian and I know we have a question about caregiving, uh, caregivers getting the vaccine. I will refer you to the IHS Gov uh, website for their newly released plan. It was released earlier last week, and it's a long document, but Please hope you your questions in that document. Um, the IHS issued a Dear Tribal Leader letter and an uh, urban Indian organization letter explaining uh, that tribal health programs and UIOs will have two options to receive the vaccine at no cost. Tribal programs and UIOs may enroll in the CDC COVID-19 vaccination program coordinated through IHS or alternatively through the relative state or local jurisdiction that they're in. CMS supports these efforts and in anticipation of when a vaccine becomes available, we will refer you back to the Indian Health Service and the CDC. IHS is taking action to ensure the participants in our programs, which are Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, and um, the associated marketplace private health plans that will all have access to an FDA authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccine at no cost. And that's the important thing is it's at no cost. Um, I will refer you to the website cms.gov backslash COVID vax, C-O-V-I-D-V-A-X as one word, COVID vax. And I'll get that in the chat section as soon as I can type. Um, this will be your centralized resource area where you'll find specific information on providers, health plans and insurers, state Medicaid programs, CHIP programs, and um, they, we plan to frequently update these resources as information becomes available. On October 28th of this year, CMS released a comprehensive plan with proactive measures to remove regulatory barriers and ensure consistent coverage and payment for the administration of an annual vaccine for millions of an eventual vaccine, just not annual, but eventual, holy cow, um, <laughs> for millions of Americans. As part of this comprehensive plan, we issued an interim final rule, and this is CMS talk, okay, interim final rule with a comment period, and we abbreviate that IFC, to remove administrative barriers to equip the American healthcare system with maximum flexibility to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency and to ensure consumers have affordable access to testing and treatment for COVID-19. The IFC was published in the Federal Register on November 6th. Uh, 2020 and written comments are due to CMS by January 4th. So that's a lot of CMS language um, that may help some of you on the call today, but I wanted to get that information out. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the vaccine in that there will be no cost sharing and it is free to Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries for the most part. Um, there's some limitations for Medicaid but I um, want to encourage all to enroll if you haven't and uh, appropriate to your age and conditions. And I want to tell you a little bit about vaccine development and testing. There's um, three stages for um, vaccine development. It's a very scary issue. I know you've probably heard on the TV, different people speaking to maybe I won't get it, maybe I will get it. Um, as a doctor, I'm going to encourage everyone to get it. Um, it is going to help us move through this pandemic. And so understanding that the vaccine um, 
first of all, take steps of, um, they do an exploration stage, which identifies the antigens or the, or the virus or bacteria. That's the issue. In this case, it's a virus. Then it moves to a preclinical stage where they test the ability of the vaccine to produce an immune response. Um, and that's done pretty much on animals. And then this, the next step is an investigational uh, phase where um, they go to the FDA and they say, we think we have a product that will work. And the FDA gives them approval to do a three phase trial. The first phase is usually with a few people, uh, 20 to 30 people uh, receive the vaccine. Uh, they may be exposed to the antigen and they do their studies. The second group involves a larger number, several hundred people. It's usually a randomized control study, which includes a placebo, which is usually saline instead of the vaccine. And then they study the vaccine safety, um, its immunogenicity, or as I said earlier, how much of an immune response um, the individual develops, and dosing issues. And then finally, a phase three trial, vaccine trial, is given to a much larger number of patients. Again, it is a randomized double-blinded study. And this is what takes so long for putting together a vaccine to be given to the public. These different phases take time. And in the third phase, it's important to assess the safety and they're looking for rare side effects. And they wanna see how well the vaccine prevents the disease and does it make antibodies or how does the immune system respond to the virus? After the phase three is completed, it goes back to the FDA and they apply to see if they can now use the drug. And the FDA then goes off and inspects the factories where the, the, where the um, vaccine is made they do appropriate labeling. They continue to follow what goes on with vaccine development. And then it makes its way through the CDC and FDA to continue continuously, once it's, it's approved, it goes to the CDC and FDA to continually look at um, and be entered into a vaccine adverse event and reporting system so that over time, any additions can be further evaluated. So that's a very quick um, demonstration or ex explanation of the different phases a vaccine goes through. In the case that we've seen so far from Pfizer and Moderna, they've done all that. It's now going back to the vaccine, to the FDA for um, emergency use. And um, I think you'll hear on the news later this week, maybe next week, I think it's next week and week after, um, the FDA will hopefully come out and say, yes, go ahead. and the vaccine will be released for use. That's a lot to be said. I don't have all the answers for that, but I wanted to give you some reassurances that that vaccine has gone through a lot of testing and it's gone through um, a lot of analysis by the FDA experts and people might argue that that's just the government once again, but I think it's in the best interest of everybody. And I would like to advocate that when time comes and if you have are given the opportunity to get the vaccine to step forward and take it. And um, hopefully that will get us through this pandemic and our numbers should improve and hopefully life will get back to some form of normalcy as uh, the vaccine is uh, distributed. So I guess I'll stop there. I'll take any questions. I'm not the CDC, I'm not the FDA, um, but I'm speaking from a physician's perspective and hope that that helped you understand a little bit more about the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. We do have a couple of questions. The first one is when the vaccine is available, will home givers be included as frontline and be considered as priority? Has anyone had any information about that or who do we speak with or contact about accessing the vaccine? Sure, I don't have any firsthand knowledge, but I would refer you to the IHS distribution plan that came out last week. Um, if, if you go on IHS.gov, they have a um, COVID section and it should be front and center in that section. 
I also sent out a link to the TTAG representatives um, at CMS. So if you know who your TTAG reps are in your area, they will have that, that link. Um, I'll try to get it into this chat section also in a little bit. Um, so I um, hope that helps answer that question. Thank you. And then the, another question is, I take care of my elderly mother and my six-year-old nephew. Do you know if it will be safe for him to get the COVID vaccine? And again, as they have gone through the different phase trials, definitely they have looked at pediatric populations and the adult populations and the work that they have done in their phase three, two and three trials. So um, my understanding is yes, it will be safe for everyone that is gonna get the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. We don't have any other questions, but um, attendees, you can either put them into the chat or the Q&A box for Dr. Carroll. And like she said, in a few moments, she'll be able to put some of those links into the chat for everyone to review. I don't see any other questions. So, oh, let's see, hold on. Do, uh, there is one other question. Do states have different priority lists? Um, that's a good question. In some cases it's yes, in other cases it's no. Again, it will depend on um, the information that has come out in the IHS vaccination plan. Um, in some cases where there may not be large Indian populations with Indian Health Service or tribal clinics, those may be under state or uh, local determinations, um, but in the larger, larger areas, um, the vac my understanding is the vaccination will go to those Indian health and tribal sites for distribution. Thank you. We do have two more questions. Uh, the first one, when are they predicting that the vaccine will be available? So the first vaccine by Pfizer, I, my understanding is that it will clear the FDA's emergency use authorization or EUA next week. And I believe Moderna's promptly a week or two later. And it will be good to go from there. And then the other question is, is any words of advice about getting traditional elders to consider the vaccine? Do you mean the elders to get the vaccine or the elders to support use of the vaccine? I guess is my question. Um, I have not heard that traditional elders are not interested in, in the vaccine. I, I don't quite have the full information. I don't see a clarification. Mm -hmm. I would take it as taking, you know, being willing to take the vaccine. And, and I, told, I, I think where that question is coming from, I totally appreciate the issue of American Indians being experimented upon years ago by, um, by and for different issues. And I, we had a conversation about this recently. And I, I think that issue, I, I'm, I'm not a traditional healer and I'm not, um, and I don't want to speak for them in any way. Um, and they have their issues, but as a doctor, understanding the methods for the present time, um, the safety and the quality control of what they're producing is important for everybody. Um, I totally appreciate American Indian Alaska Natives are very sensitive and very concerned about that. Um, and because we are a, a group that has a much higher rate of developing the disease with significant outcomes, my, um, my, my thoughts today are to show you that vaccination and vaccine development is well, well done. 
We have many other vaccines that we all receive on an annual basis for the flu, for measles, for mumps, chickenpox, for all of those. And um, there is an occasional um, significant outcome, um, but for the most part, those are safe. And I can only say that I would advocate for getting the COVID-19 vaccine um, to avoid the outcomes of that infection. Thank you. We've got uh, just one quick one. Should a mask and other precautions still be taken after getting the vaccine? Um, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that just yet. I'm sure you'll hear much to do about that in the next couple months. I see also that there's a question regarding, um, can Mr. Curley speak to the traditional elders about the vaccine? And I'd like to see if Larry could come back on and provide that support to that question. My thought on this is that our elders mean a lot to us. They represent our culture, our traditions, and the history and our language. And that there, it's important that we take care of them the best that we can. And I would just echo what uh, Dr. Carroll just said. That vaccine is important. It's gone through a tremendous uh, verification process. And uh, I would encourage all elders to take the vaccine. It's, from my understanding, it, it's safe. It's 95% effective. And that um, uh, it's something that you should consider. We want our elders to be around for as long as possible. And I would recommend and suggest that this be strongly considered by our people out there, making sure that we take care of our elders the best that we can. Thank you both very much. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and transition. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Carroll. You've spent quite a bit of time with us today. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, have another poll. Um, it is, how useful was this session for you? Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat about the webinar. It will be available um, later on. You can check the NACOA website. Um, we will provide that um, to you all. We'll leave the session, uh, the poll question open for just another moment or two. Then we'll have one more poll question and then we'll be able to do our wrap up. So most people say it's extremely and very useful. So that's great. Thank you so much for your um, input. And we've got our last and final poll of the day. What's one new thing you learned about in this webinar that you plan to use? And that is just one thing, uh, learning about the experiences of other caregivers, telehealth, connecting with loved ones from a distance, boundaries and self-care, assessing services for adults and rural settings, navigating benefits or other. And if you're comfortable, you could list in the chat box. And we'll just leave it open for another moment or two before we go ahead and transition. These poll questions really help. We greatly appreciate you answering them. They really help us um, to determine what items that we can provide to you and services as well as being able um, to have additional webinars. So it looks like most of you are uh, learning about experience of other caregivers, the telehealth. Well, thank you very much. I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Larry for our wrap up and closing. Thank you all very much for your comments, your suggestions, and uh, thank you very much as well for participating. I have been always hopeful that we can provide information that's useful to you. And I thank you all very much. We are living through a interesting time, a, a definitely trying time, but as Indian people, we have lived through many more of these things in the past and we will survive and we will persevere. And, um, I look forward to our continuing relationship and working with one another and uh, appreciate all of you. Take care of yourselves. And as a closing, it's a prayer 
for all of us. Again, in my native Navajo language. that's the end of the prayer. Thank you, Larry, and thank you all. And we'd like to thank our partners, Kaufman and Associates, National Alliance for Caregiving, Diverse Elders Coalition, and special thanks to our funder, the John A. Harford Foundation. Thank you and have a great day.